welcome uh, to the first part of this series. Um, this is for uh, Introduction to Astronomy, the online version. Um, and one of the main reasons that I love teaching astronomy, um, other than the fact that I love astronomy, is that this gives me a chance to talk about the process of science. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit like that. First, just a brief introduction for what's to come. Um, this course is going to cover most of astronomy, although I'm skipping, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of planetary science, not going to be a lot of solar system stuff, a whole different course for that. Um, so we're not going to be able to cover the whole universe, not even the whole solar system, um, but we are going to look at different um, scales of things, different parts of things. We're going to start... Um, at the Earth, actually, from what we can see from Earth. Um, talk a little bit about the solar system, uh, moving, spending quite a bit of time on stars, um, what we know about stars, how we know that, uh, and bigger out into galaxies, and then uh, talk about the beginning of everything, of the universe, uh, towards the end of the course. Um, we'll start with the night sky, uh, talking about what you can see uh, from wherever you are on Earth. Um, we'll talk about some fundamentals, some physics fundamentals like gravity, um, some astronomy fundamentals like how we measure distances, and uh, there's going to be quite a bit on the nature of light. What is light? What it means? What? How we use it to learn almost all of what we've learned uh, so far in astronomy. And finally, uh, use all those tools to look at stars, galaxies, extrasolar planets, uh, and, and the universe beyond that. But first, come back um, to what science is and how science works. Um, science is a process, not just a body of knowledge. Um, one, uh, it's, it's one way of getting to know the world around us. Uh, and I like to think of it as curiosity paired with skepticism. So curiosity meaning I'm interested in finding out what's what, what's going on, how this works. Skepticism being I'm not going to believe the first explanation that comes to mind. Um, actually have to test it um, against um, some observations, some experiments, some, you know, way to test it against um, reality. So the scientific method, you've probably heard of the scientific method in some science course and it looks like a flow chart. Uh, it is not a simple flow chart. Um, this is one representation of the scientific method. Uh, it's not, you know, always one step after the other, but it generally includes a lot of these things. Um, you, uh, very key, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor on this software, um, is to develop uh, testable predictions. Um, these are our hypotheses. So that's asking a question of, you know, or, or uh, coming up with an explanation for something that you think might be correct. Um, if you have a hypothesis, it has to have um, ways that you can test it to see if it's actually, you know, what's happening. Um, a good hypothesis in particular has to be falsifiable. You should be able to do an experiment uh, or do some observation, do some test, uh, and that, hypo that hypothesis doesn't um, hold up to it, then you have to reject it. Uh, so you do that by gathering data, testing predictions, experiments, observations. This being astronomy, there's uh, we can't do it all by experiment. We can't smash stars together necessarily. Um, we can simulate what stars smashing together might be like in a computer simulation, but we've got to compare that with our observations of what's really happening in the universe. Um, from that, uh, from all of that testing, you can develop a theory. Now, the word theory is a little troublesome because in everyday language, we use the word theory to mean, well, I think it's this. I think this is the explanation, um, which is really more hypothesis as far as science is concerned. A theory is, um, I like to think of a theory, the best way of thinking of a theory is as a model. This is a well-tested model 
Uh, so we start with a hypothesis, we tested the heck out of it, you end up with this model for how you think the universe works. We're going to see in this course that um, uh, Isaac Newton developed a model for how gravity works, and it worked really, really well until it didn't. Um, but it still works very well uh, for, you know, calculating how to move around the solar system with spacecraft. However, in the early 20th century, um, Albert Einstein developed a new theory of gravity that expanded upon Newton's um, theory because they made observations that didn't fit the original model. So you had, they had to come up with a more complex model. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about black holes, which is super fun. Um, you can still you know, make observations on theories. Um, you can think of interesting questions. Um, sometimes you think of a question first and then you test it. Sometimes you observe something weird and then you have to go back and make a hypothesis and, and test it. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not, like I said, at all linear. You do want to be able, um, you do want to have to have, a, again, a falsifiable hypothesis um, and to be able to repeat the experiments um, or observations. Uh, if you're the only person in the world who has ever recorded or seen this particular, you know, phenomenon, um, then it's not going to be scientifically accepted as a theory. Um, a great example of something that's not a scientific hypothesis is um, the uh, Carl Sagan's, Carl Sagan was an uh, astronomer, um, and his famous example of the invisible pink unicorn. So if I tell you I have a uni it, it unicorn or dragon, I'm going to go with unicorn today. Um, say I have a unicorn, I think it was dragon, but I have a unicorn in my garage. Um, and of course, if I say to you, I have a unicorn in my garage, you're going to be like, yeah, cool, I want to see it. Well, you can't see it. It's invisible. Oh, okay, well, I can go up to it and touch it. Well, if it's, it's, you can't touch it either. You know, if I keep coming up with reasons why you can't verify these observations, then uh, my statement, I have an invisible, untouchable pink unicorn in my garage, um, is not a scientific hypothesis. Um, and again, like I said, experiments, um, and ideally an experiment, if you've ever had to do a science fair project, um, you've had to come up with a hypothesis and then come up with an experiment and you want it to be, you know, in the best situation, you want it to be controlled so that you have, uh, say two groups that you're testing, say you're testing, um, or three groups say, um, my third grade science fair project is how does, or it was like, do plants need the sun? Like literally this was my project. Uh, and I had one plant that was, you know, at a, on a sunny windowsill all day and I had another plant that had a box over it half the day and then another plant that had no light whatsoever um, so I guess the control so so you've got one variable um, that you are changing uh, and I you know is you measure how much water they get and they have the same amount of soil all that stuff you keep trying to keep all of that the same uh, and only test that one variable this is not a type of, this is not something that we get to do often in astronomy. Um, again, we're going to be looking at observations um, and models uh, to figure out what's going on in the universe. Something to be aware of um, is there can be errors and biases. And error doesn't just mean, oops, I added wrong. Error could be, um, there's a fundamental limit to what you can measure. Or it could be that your instrument is measuring something differently than you think it is. Um, biases being that uh, could be <clears throat> in your instrument or in people's minds. Um, I might uh, see something weird in an experiment, and it, it you know it doesn't register that it's important to me because I you know didn't think it was an important factor, and I completely missed something. So science is complicated in that way, um, and it also makes it a very human process. There's no science in a vacuum. Science itself doesn't exist separate from humans, uh, and humans are biased. So the scientific process um, is something that uh, is messy in that way. Uh, I want to note if you're, if you're um, in this course and reading along with the textbook, 
Um, the definition of science in the textbook is specifically about natural science. Um, uh, social science is uh, another type of science where pretty much all the same things, um, pretty much all the same things as natural science is true. You have hypotheses, you test things, you make models and all that. The difference is you don't have a natural explanation. Um, for example, in sociology, you might have, or let me, let me think of something more specific that I might actually know. Um, so I have been looking at the motivations of people who do science for fun, <laughs> uh, who do citizen science or, or, or community-based science. Um, so we look for a reason why people decide to spend their free time doing science projects. Um, because it's people thinking in a certain way, it's not necessarily natural in the way, say, f you know, physics of a ball falling is natural. Um, so it's a little bit different in social science, but it's uh, subject to a lot of the same restraints and restrictions. Okay, back up a little bit. Uh, ideally, we only test one variable. Um, as I'm making these videos in July of 2020, um, there are a lot of uh, important examples of this messy scientific process that we see happening around us. Um, we are still uh, living through the COVID-19 pandemic as I'm recording this, um, although my state is one of the few that has numbers going down right now. Uh, we'll see how that looks, who knows. Um, last month in June, there was uh, a big furor over uh, two papers um, two scientific papers that uh, were retracted based on um, what they thought was happening with the data. So this goes back actually even further to this. Uh, this you may have heard of hyd oh, how do you pronounce it? Hydroxychloroquine. Oh, so um, it's it was a, a drug that was touted as having potential benefits and uh, based on a really 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 small study. Uh, which wasn't very conclusive. Um, but because of that little bit of hope, because we're in a you know very serious situation, um, emergency, it was allowed for emergency use and uh, clinical trials started back in March. So late March um, when uh, we were already, I think, pretty much in lockdown in the United States. Um, another study came out that said that hydroxychloroquine is unsafe in that it would uh, in unsafe in the way that it would actually increase the increase your likelihood of death. So they immediately halted all of these trials. This was in late May. Um, this, then the study saying that it was unsafe was retracted because the database that they were using turned out um, to be questionable. Uh, and that was in early June. The clinical trials resumed, and then in mid-June, um, the <laughs> an even larger study came out that said that it's ineffective. Um, and so the em emergency use was revoked, and the trials were stopped again. Um, this is very confusing to watch happen in the news, and, and in a way that's affecting our lives. But it's a really good illustration of the fact that science is not linear, um, and that when you can't control all the variables, such as in a human being, uh, in a human person, in, in medicine in general, um, you're going to have to do a lot of study. Um, and we're not going to have the full answers about this virus, this pandemic, uh, until much more study is done. Of course, we need to know the answers now, um, so that's why you see all of these things happening at such a fast rate. Okay. Um, since many of these systems and things are so complex, um, we can't just do an experiment. We might have to observe and make computer models of it. Uh, I mentioned that this is something we do in astronomy a whole bunch. This is very important to climate science. We can't create another Earth and not have humans live on it and see what it looks like in five billion years. Um, that's not a feasible experiment. What we are doing is observing climate patterns, um, making predictions, seeing if those predictions hold true, um, and making these complex models trying to account for all of the different variables. And those models 
will then make predictions, which we can see and observe and see if they um, come to be true. So this this graphic just shows you a little bit of like an actual, you know, computer model where they have these little cells and they do all the mathematics of what's happening um, to the atmosphere, for example, in those cells. Um, one thing this relies on, that science relies on, is an assumption that the universe is knowable, um, that nature is not unpredictably random. That's not anything we can necessarily prove, because all you need is one example to throw the whole thing off. Um, but we go with the assumption that the universe is knowable, um, and, you know, I'm not going to drop a ball and it's randomly going to fly up in the air, you know, and gravity is just going to stop working. Uh, as far as we know, pretty good. Um, we have built a lot based on the science that we have, but it's important not to forget that it does rely on, on a fundamental assumption that can't be proven. Like I said, science is done by humans. So it is a human endeavor. Uh, this is an example of some of the lovely humans that I get to do science with. Um, this is a, a group of folks, this is from, gosh, 2013, uh, some scientists and science educators who, from all different fields, who gathered to do hands-on experiments with kids at a sci-fi convention in Seattle. Um, so I've been, I've been fortunate to do that several years. But as you see, there's all different people working in science. We have chemists, we have biologists. We have, uh, let's see, mammologist and uh, education researcher and an anthropologist and <laughs> a physicist and then there's me, an astronomer, um, uh, all different fields, all different people, um, and importantly, all different backgrounds and perspectives to bring to science. One of the things um, to keep in mind is that science is not, uh, science has consequences. Um, so, for example, uh, I brought up climate change already. Measurements of the global temperature show that the temperature of the globe, and the entire globe, has been going up pretty significantly um, since the Industrial Revolution, basically, late 19th century, but also very seriously in the last 50 years or so. Um, there are... Um, the link to that is uh, a sudden spike in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It means it helps trap heat in the earth, which is really useful because if we had no greenhouse gases, the entire planet would be covered in ice and completely uninhabitable. However, a little too much greenhouse gases and that's jacking the temperature up. So this graph is showing you back uh, 400,000 years and the level of carbon dioxide um, as measured from you know very deep ice cores that are drilled into glaciers um, it, it, ha it has you know a natural um, periodicity things happen on the earth that either let out a lot more carbon dioxide or pull in a lot more carbon dioxide uh, but the levels that it's at now are way beyond anything that's been seen in that history so the temperature is rising rapidly and due to the fact that the carbon dioxide is rising rapidly. And my dog's probably gonna start barking. I apologize, you'll get to meet my dog at some point. <laughs> um, one thing that has um, been discussed is whether or not that carbon dioxide is due to human influence. Um, and this is another place where these models are very important. Um, because you can model what the carbon dioxide levels would be like with and without human influence and predict what the temperatures are going to look like. Um, and so this graph is showing you a prediction without human influence. That is what you would see um, carbon dioxide levels doing. I believe these events here, I don't actually know entirely. I, I want to say they're volcanic events, but I'm not sure. Um, and then these red spikes are due to... Uh, this is the prediction of what the temperature would be when uh, humans are um, giving off carbon dioxide through all the machines that we do. Um, and then the actual measured temperature is this gray line and you see the prediction that bears out is the one where there is human influence there. So not super fun. Um, one thing to note is that 
climate change in particular is not just about science. It's going to take more than just science to deal with that problem. Um, problem large part created by science, large part, part created by our society. We're going to need all of those factors to do something about it. This is just showing um, the sea level for North Carolina uh, and how that's rising due to rising temperatures. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, there are scientific ways to limit carbon dioxide, but there's also affects the economy and people's lives. So you have to think about what are the sociological implications? Uh, how do we communicate these things? How do we deal with this economically? So it takes an actually a much more complex, cohesive look to look at these problems. So science is great. I love it. Science doesn't work by itself um, in, in our lives. Now, uh, I wanted to do a note about pseudoscience because that is uh, something where something seems scientific. It seems to follow the rules of science, but when you look closer, it doesn't. Uh, and I tried and I tried to pick what I thought would be a pseudoscience that, you know, nobody would possibly, you know, still believe in. Um, and this is phrenology, which involves the measurement of a human's head, like their skull shape, which I thought my new buzz cut would would, you know, show nicely um, based on the bumps in their head. Uh, you could predict their mental traits. Um, and and this is you know not something I think anyone's going around feeling each other's heads to see what their personalities are like. However, as I I was chatting, I was on a group chat with some friends talking about this. Uh, my friend Steve immediately sent me a link of something that had just happened that day or the day before. Um, in that uh, an artificial intelligence journal was still. Uh, was using results related to phrenology to predict criminality based on facial shape. Um, so even something that I thought was totally weird and nobody could possibly still believe in, um, phrenology is related to more generally to, oh, I guess, physiognomy is, is the word for the believing this about the face. Um, and that these are, these have been used um, in the past um, to back racist claims. You know, science has been misused, and pseudoscience has been misused in a lot of ways. Um, this is one such way. And so uh, this facial analysis, artificial intelligence software, um, uh, claims to predict how criminal someone is. Um, but uh, there was a huge uproar amongst computer scientists who were pointing out that this is a debunked racial, racialized pseudoscience. Um, so I'll keep looking. One of these days I'll find a pseudoscience that absolutely no one believes in, but so far I have not. Okay, I don't want to end on a super sad note. Uh, I did want to end uh, showing one of my favorite telescopes is the Very Large Array. Uh, if you're reading the textbook that goes along with this course, uh, they feature that in the in the first chapter um, because it is a telescope. It's not what you would think of when you think of a telescope. It's 27 radio antennas spread throughout the desert, um, but it's really cool and we will talk about telescopes soon. Um, and for all of its complexity and for all of its difficulties, science has brought us good and beautiful and wonderful things. And so I'm really excited over the, this course to look at and understand a lot of those beautiful, wonderful things, um, such as this gorgeous photo uh, that was taken at the VLA um, that shows the Milky Way uh, or looking into the disk of our galaxy overhead. All right, that's it for this first one. I'll see you soon.